everyone, James Mantle here bringing you yet another movie review. Oh my God, you guys. So I am so excited that I've infiltrated successfully the movie review community, but I haven't recruited all of you yet. So I'm gonna do a social experiment right now. Bear with me, subscribers. Here we go. For anyone new watching this that loves movies, picture me like this. Look at me. Look at my big, full beard. Look at my Pantera shirt that I may or may not superimpose in here if I can find one. Listen to me. Listen to my opinions. They're relevant. They matter. I too love the big Lebowski. No, I don't. You are gonna love my opinions, so ignore my breasts, my hair, and my feminine voice, and listen to the things I have to say, because I'm a neckbeard just like you. All right, snap out of it. Here we go, guys. I am so excited to do this movie review. Well, sort of. I have to apologize in advance because I went to go see Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, the newest film by Quentin Tarantino, an influential-ish director. Now, me and Quentin have a very, very well layered history together. I like a majority of his movies and sometimes they're a bit of a miss and this is probably gonna be one of those times. So let's get started. I'm not gonna paraphrase a whole lot for you because honestly, not a whole lot happened in this movie. Let's get into it. Leonardo DiCaprio is basically playing like this down and out actor, like full on like 1969 is our setting, right? And he's a Western star that is now doing TV work and has since gotten out of work because you know, it's the late 1960s and no one's watching Westerns anymore. So he's washed up and he's best friends with Brad Pitt, who was his stuntman for years and years and years. So most of the movie is just Leonardo DiCaprio trying to recap his fade and career and Brad Pitt sort of like slumming around the movie trying to find something to do. It seemed like this whole movie he was driving around trying to find a different one to be in. In the meanwhile, what we have going on as a different plot is Sharon Tate is wandering around Hollywood, you know, just being her best Sharon Tate. That's Margot Robbie. And we're suddenly finding ourselves in the setting of what we think is the beginning of the Manson murders because we're following around Sharon Tate and soon we're following around the Charles Manson followers. We even get a peek at Charles Manson very, very briefly in the movie. All their lives seem to intertwine with each other because it turns out Sharon Tate lives next door to Leo DiCaprio's character, whose name I completely forgot. Honestly, this movie was such, such a drag to get through, you guys. And I mean, no pun intended, like, I was really ready to like watch this movie and be invested. And certain moments did hold me, but the rest of them just sitting there like, okay, are we going somewhere with this? Because it seems like it's a lot of talking and you're not really saying a whole lot. But I think that might also have to do with the fact that being, you know, a member of Hollywood, <laughs> that's right, I'm amongst the Hollywood, you know, crowds, sort of. So I can say when it comes to the trials and tribulation of, you know, the actor's struggle and the actor's story, especially the successful actor and the successful actor's, you know, stories, I find it really hard to sympathize with anything they're going through, you guys. I'm so sorry. Like, I'm sitting here listening to Leonardo DiCaprio bitch and bitch and bitch about his career and, like, lack of career. And the fact he has to fly to Rome to make spaghetti westerns, that's, like, a big plot in this movie, too. He, like, doesn't want to go to Rome and make, you know, subpar western movies. Which, again, I know a lot about this stuff because, like, Spaghetti Westerns were really, really big in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And like every B-list, D-list celebrity was doing them. Like from your Mamie Van Doren's to your Jane Mansfield's, they all went over and made Spaghetti Westerns or spy movies or gladiator movies. All that stuff was happening at that time. And they paid money for them. So they made a lot of money doing it. And to be fair, a lot of them ended up on Mystery Science Theater because they were not very, very good. So I could understand that. But also it's just like, God, all Leonardo DiCaprio did in this movie was bitch about stuff and nothing was happening. I'm just sitting here, it's like meeting, 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 hanging out with Brad Pitt, broing down with Brad Pitt. But where's the plot? Where are we going here, guys? I feel like I'm just hanging out with a couple of boring friends that I don't want to be there. It's like when you're at a party with people and it's like, okay, these people stink, but you have to like wait because your ride is like friends with them. So you just have to wait until they've like had their fill and then you can leave. This is like pre-Uber days, guys. This is what you had to do before we had Uber. And you're just waiting and waiting because your ride is just taking forever because they're really feeling their fantasy and you're just so bored. That was me in this movie. Ernesto next to me died. He died of boredom 
and he couldn't hold his bladder and had to leave six or seven times. And honestly, it wasn't hard to fill him in on what happened because nothing was happening. <sighs> okay, so let's get to Margot Robbie. Now, the whole Sharon Tate plot seemed a little weird for me because it's like, she didn't really seem like she needed to be in this movie. It was mostly kind of sensationalism having her there. Like, it could have been a completely made up character and it would have had the same effect because like, she didn't do a whole lot. Like, all I really learned about Sharon Tate was like, she was a nice person. And it's like, well, yeah, we already knew that. And watching her, like, you know, enjoy herself in the movie theater was cute and all, but, like, it was also masked with the fact that, like, it was basically, like, gratuitous shots of Margot Robbie's feet throughout the whole movie. <laughs> oh, my God, new segment. For any Quentin Tarantino movie, we're going to start this new segment called Foot Watch 2019. In this movie, we've had Margot Robbie's feet, Dakota Fanning's feet, that hitchhiker girl's feet, and with an interesting show of diversity, Leonardo DiCaprio's feet, because they are awfully dainty. <laughs> Quentin Tarantino is obviously, we all know it by now, that he has a major, major foot fetish and kind of plugs it into all of his movies, which is like, you know, good for you, girl, normalize it. But I could smell this movie, girl, like that hitchhiker's feet all up in my face on that dashboard. It's like, oh, God damn it. So many shots of dirty girl feet. I don't want to see it in my movies. I'm sorry, you guys. I draw the line there. I don't want to see dirty hitchhiker girl feet. I swear if Quentin Tarantino could, this movie would have had the theater gimmick of scratch and sniff, girl. All right, where was I? So yeah, oh yeah, the plot. Well, that was like the first half of the movie. The second half of the movie dragged just as long as the first one. So the second half, after he goes to Italy and he's coming back, he is basically getting ready to prepare for his last night with Brad Pitt because I guess he got married off camera. Like that happened a lot too, where like they'd fill in the rest with like narration and commercials and shots from movies that Leonardo DiCaprio was doing that I think they thought was really, really interesting the house. But like, I don't know about you guys, but if I'm watching in one movie's plot and I'm following that, I don't want to suddenly be transported to another movie's plot where I don't have any context as what in the scene is going on. That would happen a lot where it's just like suddenly we're inside of a Western that Leonardo DiCaprio is making, but I don't know the storyline to it, so I don't know what's going on. They reference Michael Sarn in this, like you see the poster for Joanna hanging up, and Michael Sarn was one of the people that pioneered that kind of filmmaking where he'd insert like footage from different movies to help tell a bigger narrative. And the one movie he did that majorly with was Meyer Brackenridge. So when he did that, he basically used that to pad up the film because he wasn't comfortable with the material he was doing. And it shows a lot watching it back. It kind of felt like he was trying to make a statement, but he didn't really know what. And so he just kind of like kept throwing shit at the like wall to see what stuck. And honestly, it's just like, it feels like someone's creative writing essay when they didn't have any kind of like, you know, narrative to tie them down. A lot of people are comparing this to Jackie Brown, but Jackie Brown had an Elmer Leonard novel to tie to it that had a, like a cohesive plot and like, you know, everything moving forward and good characters. All Quentin had to do was film it and, you know, put some fun dialogue in between. Whereas with this, there wasn't a whole lot happening. And like, you can tell when he was left to his own devices, like the writing was great. Like the dialogue was funny, but there was no plot to speak of really. I feel like me and Ernie were both sitting there like, well, we paid for this. We might as well see it through. Ernesto was ready to leave. <laughs> we were this close to walking out because honestly, I would have rather watched this in the comfort of my home. This is not something I would have watched on my own, like in a theater paying money, especially if I'm doing dinner in a movie. I don't want to watch this. Like I want to be able to like, you know, put this on while I'm doing dishes or something like that. Like I would not pay money to see this in a theater. But I did. So here we go. I'm making you a movie review. I honestly, it was between this and Crawl. And I never thought I'd say to myself, I would pass up a Quentin Tarantino movie for the giant alligator movie, but here we are. Now there are some things that happened in this movie that were sort of out of place with like actual celebrities. Aside from the Sharon Tate subplot, there was also like a mini plot between Brad Pitt and Bruce Lee for some reason. And I love the portrayal of Bruce Lee in this movie because he was like such a prissy little queen and you know she was. Oh my God, she was like feeling herself. And like they get into this brawl, which is like one of the one times I perked up in the movie, like, ooh, this is interesting. What's happening? What's going on? Like I woke up for this because it's like Bruce Lee versus Brad Pitt. And oddly enough, Brad Pitt got the upper hand, which is not surprising for this kind of movie. But still, I digress. That plot gets abandoned immediately. And then we're at our third act, which is, here's our setup. Our protagonist, Brad Pitt and Leo, have returned to their swank Hollywood home, right? He's got his new Italian wife and Brad Pitt's like having his last hurrah with Leonardo DiCaprio because, you know, they're going to go their separate ways because they can't afford each other anymore. 
And Sharon Tate is having her infamous party in the Hollywood Hills next door. So we're all like, okay, we know what's happening here. Let's settle in because this is gonna get really uncomfortable. And I don't know what it is about the Sharon Tate murders. It's been 50 years now and it's still so uncomfortable for me to watch any kind of portrayal of it. And this is the second movie this year that's had the Sharon Tate murders as its subject. Like we had the haunting of Sharon Tate with um, the other gay guy from Mean Girls and Hilary Duff, which I haven't seen, but it looked tawdry and horrible. And the Tate family was really upset about it. Whereas I feel like they saw this one, they'd probably be a little more like happy with it because Sharon Tate honestly was barely in it. And it was barely about that. So ultimately what happens is the Manson followers are making their way towards the house, right? They have knives in tow. They're all crazed out. They're all making their speeches about how, you know, the television has taught them to hate people and taught them to kill. So now they have reasoning in their mind to do it, right? And what sets them off is Leonardo DiCaprio hears the hippie car making a lot of noise, right? And he goes out and he yells at these hippies. He yells at Tex Watson to get the hell out of here, you dirty hippies. And they do only to like, you know, park their car somewhere and start walking with knives in tow, ready to kill some people. And in an interesting way of misdirection, instead of going to the Tate house, they decide to attack Leonardo DiCaprio's house. So in doing this, they meet up with Brad Pitt, the stuntman, who's already been established like this super tough guy, you know, Superman, you know, stuntman, can do anything, can kill anybody, mysteriously kill his wife. We're not too sure about it. They never really give us a clear answer. They end up crashing into him and he is tripping balls off of an acid cigarette that he bought from one of them, ironically. And they have their standoff, right? Brad Pitt is so blazed right now, right? And Tex Watson's sitting there with a knife. And in an interesting turn of events, you know, cute dog that Brad Pitt's been starving and torturing this whole movie, he snaps for him and the dog goes and attacks Tex Watson and all hell breaks loose, right? Tex Watson just starts getting his ass kicked by Brad Pitt. And then, you know, Susu gets her ass kicked by the Italian girl and then Brad Pitt switches gears and starts attacking her and the dog starts attacking the other girl and it's action happening all over the place, right? Like people are getting their faces bashed into walls. Brad Pitt is owning everyone for the first time in like three years. Brad Pitt's been likable. I couldn't believe it, right? I was having a blast. Cut to the finale. We have one of the girls shoots Brad Pitt and leaps through a window because she's like blinded by getting attacked by an attack dog, right? She goes through a patio door window, which I remember seeing in another movie that killed somebody, but in this one, she's like <laughs> a super woman. She breaks through that, falls in the pool, delirious, can't see, her, right? And Leonardo DiCaprio is laying in the pool, gets freaked the hell out. So he manages to get out and grab a flamethrower and starts using a flamethrower on this girl, right? Without context, this sounds completely insane, which is like the third act was completely worth it, right? But it was so short lived. So this girl gets cooked and Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio bro down and have their final goodbyes for the movie sake, at least. And then we end with Leonardo DiCaprio walking next door to the Tate house and spending the night with her and having a great night with Sharon Tate. She never gets murdered. To sum it up, I would say this was a fantasy movie, obviously. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, it's a fairy tale about Hollywood. What I found interesting about this was like, it's sort of a modern day-ish idea of what a fairy tale would be if you could go back in time and change history to like reflect a different event. It's sort of like how people like make movies about the Titanic with storylines that never really happened, right? It's sort of like that with like the Sharon Tate murders. They decided what would happen if we went a different direction with this, if certain things didn't happen, how would time have played out? So it's a fantasy in that regard, which I thought was kind of cute and clever, but again, a little bit in poor taste because like it's still pretty fresh in people's memories. And the whole thing that happened with the Sharon Tate murders is still so gruesome and so horrible to think about that it still does make you uncomfortable and is super cringe. But that's my take on it. Like, it's still so, so cringe to even think about. I thought it was, you know, admirable for Quentin to attempt this. It was an awfully boring film until that third act. And as far as whatever point he was trying to make, I'm sure people in the Hollywood elite would love this film because it was speaking their language. But for all of us that, you know, just go to see movies, as for us who aren't in the Hollywood elite that don't give a shit about actors or, the, you know, their trials and tribulations because we don't live that life, wait till it's on streaming or Blu-ray, DVD, whatever you, your speed, you know? Just don't go see it in theaters. And if you do, catch the budget showing, girl. So yeah, that was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I was, you know, I was along for a ride. It was a long ride, girl. So I will be back next time with a different movie and hopefully <laughs> a lot more to talk about because yeah, this movie happened and we're just gonna put that one on the docket. Wish I had seen Crawl, but you know what? 
It's fine. It's fine. We have this now. Thank you, Quentin Tarantino. Is Crawl still showing? Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And until next time, bye. Click here and watch my last movie review on Midsummer. It's the best Midsummer review you'll ever see. Trust me. Or if you're feeling artsy, be sure to check out me makeover Pearl's Bladonna doll by Kid Robot. Come on, click it. You know you want to. If you don't click it, I'll tell Quentin all about your sweaty size sixes in those ballet flats. So click it.